Welcome to our 35th ATS COVID Critical Care Training Forum. So we're gonna get started. Please let me know um, in the chat or otherwise if you have are having issues with sound or you can't hear us at all. Um, so like I said, welcome to our 35th ATS COVID Critical Care Training Forum. Uh, the title of today's session is Caring for Yourself so you can care for others to manage anger, frustration, and sadness in the setting of caring for unvaccinated critical care COVID patients. So my name is Sushma Cribbs. Um, I'm from Emory University and I'll be moderating the session today. Uh, we have a great line of speakers here for you today. Ankita Agarwal is a fourth year fellow from Emory University. Venkatesh Ramnath will be speaking with us first from uh, UCSD. And Wes Ely will be joining us from Vanderbilt University. Just a quick word on our upcoming session, which is on October 5th. Uh, myself and Nero Shah will be moderating the session on Delta in children. Uh, what are the risks? I know many of us have had concerns with Delta and COVID and our unvaccinated children. So I think this will be a great informative session for all. So please come join us for that one. This is just a list of some of the sessions we've done in the past. All these additional sessions are recorded and available for free on the ATS website. You can search for ATS COVID Forum, or you can scan this QR code and that'll take you directly uh, to the recorded sessions. In addition, uh, please give us feedback. Uh, this is a QR code that you can scan for the survey and we'll put a survey link into the chat as well uh, towards the end of our session. Uh, we really want these sessions to be relevant to you. We've been doing them now for about a year and a half and want to make sure that we're addressing all your concerns and needs when it comes to this. So please give us feedback. Um, just takes a couple minutes to do the survey. Um, I don't want to end this intro without thanking my co-chairs for this ATS COVID Critical Care Training Forum. Um, and our team of trainees, and especially our ATS staff, uh, without whom none of these sessions would be possible, and they're really critical to this mission here. So with that, I will end and introduce our first speaker. So our first speaker is Dr. Ankita Agarwal. Uh, Dr. Agarwal is a fourth year pulmonary critical care fellow at Emory University. Her main clinical and scientific interests are palliative care in the ICU, and she is currently the PI of a study studying intensive, intensivist workload as it relates to burnout in the ICU. So Dr. Agarwal, thank you for joining us today, and you are welcome to share your slides when you're ready. Thank you so much for having me here. I am very excited to take everyone through two cases that I hope highlight a little bit of some of the questions and thoughts that come up related to this topic. So I'm gonna take us through the cases fairly quickly and highlight really some of the salient points um, and not necessarily all of the medical care that went into them. So our first gentleman is the case of uh, Mr. J.O. He presented with a chief complaint of shortness of breath. He is a 53 year old gentleman. He was diagnosed with COVID-19 about a week prior to him presenting to the hospital, and he came in with complaints of worsening shortness of breath. Both him and his family are unvaccinated. He ended up pretty quickly being admitted for hypoxic respiratory failure to the medical wards. He was started on fairly standard therapy, supplemental oxygen, steroids, from remdesivir, tocilizumab. And on hospital day four, he ended up being transferred to the ICU for further management and decompensated hypoxic respiratory failure. A little context of who he was before the ICU, he had a past medical history of hypertension, sleep apnea, he's a prior smoker. He is married for 15 years and he lives with his wife, his two children, an adult son and a daughter in high school, as well as his daughter-in-law, and his one-year-old grandson. He had worked as a school bus driver for many, many years and had stopped working during the pandemic and had very strong connections with his local Baptist community. Um, as I said before, both him, his wife, his children, um, 
and daughter-in-law were all unvaccinated. And prior to his hospitalization, his wife had actually had COVID-19 and she had been hospitalized in a different hospital. Luckily, she had not needed to be in the ICU and was at home on supplemental oxygen by the time he presented. So I'm gonna take you briefly through his extended ICU course. So on the very first day he presented to the ICU on day one, he was started on high flow nasal cannula. Uh, by day four, he was on maximal high flow nasal cannula settings during the day and non-invasive ventilation at night. Day 10, he ended up being intubated and following which had invasive lines placed. He was very quickly paralyzed and prone and on very high ventilator settings at 100% oxygen and a PEEP of 18. A Couple of days later had a worsening kidney injury. He was started on inhaled flow land, subsequently started on continuous renal replacement therapy. And about week two of the ICU, we had a palliative care consult placed. He was also, treated with for septic shock uh, due to a urinary tract infection. Day 20, unfortunately, his shock picture continued to worsen. He had a second infection, a sputum growing MRSA, so likely a ventilator associated pneumonia at this point, remained on the very high vent settings. And again, a bio2 of 100% and a peep of about 20. Day 25, unfortunately, he started having some complications with long-term intubation. He had an endotracheal cuff leak noted, um, was not changed due to being, him being a high risk as his ventilator settings had still not changed. Day, next day, he started having a lower GI bleed, likely related to a fecal management system, um, continued to be in shock and on high ventilator settings. On day 29, he started having worsening hypoxemia. And at this point, family discussions really started to escalate regarding goals of care. Unfortunately, on day 30, he continued to have declining respiratory status, refractory hypoxemia. And at that time, the family decided to pursue comfort care and he passed very quickly after that decision. While he was in the ICU, um, at home, both his son and his daughter-in-law contracted COVID-19. His one-year-old grandson contracted COVID-19. Fortunately, all three of them do recover. Um, the son and the daughter-in-law got vaccinated. At the time of his uh, death in the ICU, his wife was not vaccinated, and I was never clear on his daughter's vac vaccination status. So for our first case, I have a quick poll question to ask everyone, um, so please participate, of should unvaccinated family members be allowed to visit patients with COVID-19? This was one of the questions that came up um, as talking to the nurses, the other providers, nurse practitioners, PAs taking care of him, respiratory therapists, and other physicians as well. So just give a couple more, a little bit more time for people to respond here. And at this point, if you have thoughts about the questions, if you want to put stuff in the chat, our moderators and discussants are looking at our chat and can respond. Okay, so I'm going to end the poll here and just share the results with everyone. So hopefully everyone can see the results on their screen. Great. Okay. Eva. Couple other questions. These don't have polls associated with them, just things to think about and questions that came up for us was, can healthcare providers be conscientious objectors similar to people with war? Is, could it be considered child abuse if parents don't get vaccinated and their children get COVID? Uh, and is it fair to allow an unvaccinated patient 30 plus days of intense ICU care when ICU beds are a limited resource? So I don't have answers to these questions, but um, as you're thinking about them, I'd like to dive into our second case. It's a little bit shorter. This is a case of RS. Uh, uh, once again, coming in with a chief complaint of shortness of breath. So young lady, 31 year old with a history of asthma and presented with shortness of breath without relief from inhalers for about two or three days prior to presentation. She actually had a rapid COVID-19 test in the emergency department, although didn't have any complaints besides the shortness of breath uh, and had a clear chest X-ray. 
her medical history, notable only for her asthma. She's never a smoker and she is also unvaccinated. Her ER course, so she actually decompensates fairly quickly in the ER uh, with hypoxic respiratory failure, altered mental status. She's quickly intubated and admitted to the ICU for asthma. In the first hour of her ICU admission, yeah, you can see her initial ventilator settings. She's complicated by auto peep, requiring ventilator disconnection, bagging her, following which we optimize for sedation, neuromuscular blockade, and steroids and nebulizers. Her mother, who's her next of kin, is notified as well of her admission at this point. At hour three, she is worsening hypox hypercapnia. Sorry, Her ventilator settings are changed to try and deal with the hypercapnia. Heliox is added to the system. And because of her young age and other lack of other comorbidities, actually an ECMO consult is placed. At hour six of the ICU, she's successfully cannulated for venous venous ECMO. Her initial ECMO settings you can see, and then ventilator settings are standard for patients on ECMO. And she's admitted to our cardiothoracic ICU, which is where we handle ECMO patients in this hospital. And from there, her course actually progressed very quickly. She was extubated on day four. She was decannulated from ECMO on day five of her hospital stay transferred out of the ICU on day six, and in just over a week was discharged home with a prolonged steroid taper. On the day of her transfer out of the ICU onto the medical floor, she asked the ICU team if she had been vaccinated against her wishes for COVID-19 and stated that she would quote unquote, sue the hospital and everyone if she had been vaccinated. Uh, obviously she had not been vaccinated against her wishes. So a few more poll questions at this point. So first one, should we, should we be allowed to vaccinate people hospitalized with COVID-19 against their wishes? Give it another couple of seconds here. Okay. So sharing results on this, majority of people have said no here, um, which I think makes sense. Uh, a little bit of a corollary or secondary part of this question of do, if we say yes, or if we could do this, do we have to tell them that they're being vaccinated for COVID-19. We do a lot of vaccinations in the hospital. Okay. I'm not seeing any more votes come in, so I will share the results. Majority say yes. Um, but Someone at least out there said, maybe not. Okay. And last poll question for on my end, should advanced therapies that use a lot of resources and are limited therapies like ECMO be offered to unvaccinated patients? This one's interesting to watch as the responses are coming in. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna give it one, a couple more seconds here. A few more people voting. All right. So we're a little bit more divided here. And when we think about this, one thing that always comes up to me is if no, then who gets to make that decision and where where do we draw the line of therapies we offer and don't offer and with that i'm going to actually pass it off to our other speakers um, and hopefully we have some answers for these questions
Thanks so much, Ankita. Definitely very provocative, thought-provoking cases. So I really appreciate you bringing those issues to light. Um, so I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Venkatesh Ramnath. Dr. Ramnath is an associate professor at the University of California in San Diego. Since his training in pulmonary and critical care, he has spent more than a decade as ICU director of academic and community hospitals across the country while incorporating telemedicine and digital health innovation. He is currently the medical director of critical care telemedicine outreach and uses digital technology to evaluate, diagnose, and treat ICU patients who are located far from the UCSD health facility. His research interests include tele-ICU systems, bioethical issues in the ICU, patient and family empowerment in the ICU, and digital health applications for inpatient and ICU care. I think we can all agree that these modalities have been very important during the COVID-19 pandemic. So thank you for being here with us today, Dr. Ramnath, and you are welcome to share your slides as soon as you're ready. Great, thank you for that warm introduction. And it's a pleasure to be sharing the stage with Dr. Agarwal and also Dr. Ely, with whom I've, uh, I've uh, shared the, some of these challenges for a long time. So this is a way of giving an introduction to a really important topic that has become more and more salient uh, during the COVID pand pandemic. And I hope it can provide some insight uh, that, that could be useful for everybody. So I'm gonna move relatively quickly, time is short, but I do wanna cover, cover, cover a couple of objectives. One is to understand why this is so important. Why is it important to identify that stress in ICU physicians especially during the pandemic, but even outside of that, is something that we need to focus on. The second thing is, can we learn some tools about what we can do in the moment that we're feeling some of these distressing uh, emotions and feelings after the moment and before the next moment of stress, which comes with the job. So why, are we, and why am I talking to all of you? As Dr. Cribbs has, has mentioned, I've spent more than 10 years uh, in community and academic settings in this country, as well as around the world, whether it's Indonesia, India, uh, Africa, um, and Europe. And I feel like some of the themes we're talking about are not unique to any one specific location. They are themes that permeate the, the practice of critical care medicine, irrespective of the context. So I think that there's some, some, something we can all take from this. Um, I've incorporated some of that into what I do every day as the medical director for telemedicine outreach and critical care for UCSD. We, we are right near the border, um, and as there are a lot of transnational cross-border issues that resonate really across this country and across the world, so hopefully we can learn from that. And I've also spent a lot of time working side-by-side -side with palliative care physicians, chaplains, social workers, psychiatrists, ethicists um, in academic settings, but also in community settings. And I've learned uh, a lot of skills that um, hopefully you'll find some meaning in as well. So first off, I'd like to just uh, talk about why does this even matter? Why should we, we be focusing ourselves? Well, there's increasing attention and recognition that mood disorders, whether it's anxiety, uh, symptoms of post-traumatic stress, depression, uh, and others are highly prevalent in our profession. Upwards of 50 to 60% uh, or more have been, we, we fit the, the characteristics of that, and this is not going away. And in fact, it's actually getting worse as this was actually recognized during, during pre-pandemic times. It is a sad fact that our profession uh, is known for being uh, the leader in suicides. So about three to 400 uh, unfortunate folks take their lives um, every year. And so that's something that we need to take very seriously. Um, uh, Dr. Agarwal mentioned this earlier, but it is like being on the front line of war. When the kind of medicine that we do, it's high stakes. The kinds of errors or interventions can either prevent death or it can actually exacerbate it or, or actually cause death if, 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 uh, if circumstances are unfortunate. Uh, we're also, irrespective of that, surrounded by death. There's a, there are a lot of folks that no matter what we do, um, we have to admit that we cannot save everybody. Um, there is a lot, the environment of our workplace does not lend itself to well-being. We, we, a lot of us do night shifts, um, even just carrying things from the day cause a disruption in our normal circadian patterns. And the environment itself on a day-to-day -day basis, it's hyper-stimulating. There's a tons of information. More and more patients are coming, uh, asking more of us. And so at the end of the day, 
we work in a very physically demanding, but also emotionally demanding place. And it was already escalating, but COVID-19 just made everything worse. And so some have claimed, well, you, this is part of the job. You, know, you signed up for this. Well, that may be true, but we also need to focus on how do we de-stress. All of us providers, uh, including patients and families, but us providers, whether we're nurses and today we're talking about physicians, um, feel this on a day-to-day -day basis. We are all high performers. We did that just to get into medical school and beyond. So we're used to pushing through obstacles. But as, as we have seen, you know, our healthcare system is not perfect. In fact, it is very far from perfect. And those fra that fragmentation and some of the inefficiencies that even COVID-19 has brought to bear um, really get in the way of providing the best interest of the patient in ways that aren't always obvious. They're not always transparent or even possible. And so we have to realize that there's a trade-off. We can continue to push against a system uh, and ourselves uh, or we can recognize that we need to invest in ourselves. And so what I'm gonna talk about next, next is, how do we even define this? Before we start focusing on what to do, let's just recognize first that this isn't just one catch-all term called burnout. So it all starts with moral dilemmas. And I think Dr. Agarwal pointed out some of them very nicely. You know, when are the circumstances when um, what we want for a patient can't happen? So, you know, do, does a patient um, who's receiving ECMO, is that the right patient to offer this person as opposed to someone else? Is there a therapy that I could have given uh, and, and I can't give it? These are more dilemmas that we handle on a daily basis, looking at risk benefit profiles. Um, we have to resolve those and process those. Uh, and to add to that mix, uh, there are individual morals that we, each one of us has, and Dr. Agarwal also pointed out being a conscientious objector, may play a part in that where our own morals may go up against the system values. And if we cannot resolve those kinds of conflicts that can carry, we have to carry that maybe to the next encounter. And the accumulation of these distresses can then become permanent. And that's what we call moral injury. And when it becomes an irreversible situation that can fall into the category of burnout, which can actually come from various different origins. How do these manifest? We, we have seen this uh, in real time, but people feel depersonalized. We have this thing called compassion fatigue where we just can't give the, we can't be empathic. We feel isolated. Uh, some of us feel these mood disorders that I talked about. They have a physical disorders as well. Um, we may have to repress our emotions. Some turn unfortunately to substance abuse or even self-injury. And there may be other um, longer term complications as well, sort of in the post-traumatic sort of um, framework. So I'm gonna offer some things to think about both in the moment, right after the moment and before the next moment. These are just a point of departure for some, some tools to use that I have found myself and my team, I uh, found useful and we, we talk about these. So in the moment, I'm gonna to suggest to do the following. When you feel something that doesn't feel right, hit the pause button. What does that even mean? Well, we need to learn about being self-aware, being observing yourself. What's your body posture? How is your tone of speech? Um, are you feeling sweaty in the palms? Um, are you feeling that cramp in your neck? Um, notice the triggers that are causing that. And what we call, you know, Lisa Feldman Barrett wrote a book, um, How Emotions Are Made, where she highlighted interception. And this is a common, um, this is a, a common concept in, in neuroscience. How, do, how does our body sense what's happening in the environment and how does it manifest, whether it's a sweaty palm or a, a crick in the neck or something like that? Once you recognize that, don't judge it. Forgive yourself, it's okay. It's all right to feel these emotions because you're a human being and this is a difficult situation. At the next moment though, you can make, you can understand that there are proactive uh, opportunities around these feelings. We do not have to be completely reactive in that moment. We may have to recognize there's a beginning and end to everything, sort of like a, a Buddhist way of saying, you know, things are impermanent. Um, but we also have choices around control. And sometimes it put, means putting what we're feeling aside for the moment so we can get through the difficulty on behalf of our patients and families, uh, but to recognize that we're in control uh, at, at all these moments. However, it's also important to recognize that sometimes you can't do that. And if you can't do that, please reach out, stop what you're doing, maybe contact a supervisor, maybe contact a colleague um, to help out. And that, that is really important to not go into the danger zone where thing, when harm could actually happen to multiple different individuals. 
Now, after that moment has passed, there's an opportunity for processing. Um, here are some things that I've found useful. First of all, turn off stimuli. It was probably one of the hardest things I've done, but I, I turned off my phone notifications, believe it or not. Um, and it was a sort of a, a, an eye-opening experience for me to not have to get pinged and, 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 and have that stimulation persist longer than uh, the original event. Be in nature, take time off and go into nature. There's a, a really great book called The Extended Mind by Annie Paul that talks about how there's actually a neurobiologic uh, element to being in nature, being a uh, enhancing creativity of the mind, but also productivity. It allows your mind to basically disconnect from some, from maybe some un unfortunate or un uncomfortable sensations and feelings and to be able to engage in a different way. Exercise we know is uh, beneficial on multiple levels, but it can be an antidepressant, but also again, it ga engages you to get back into your body. Um, the second thing is to reflect on past experiences that may have been similar. Now it's not gonna be the same, but maybe there were other crises in the past that might have been uh, informative in terms of how you made it through that, what worked and what didn't work, whether they personal, professional, or both. Um, crisis counselors often talk about the fence. So not using what you're going through as a negative experience to define your entire identity or the entire experience, to draw the line uh, between what you're feeling and compartmentalize that and process that for its own, um, for, in its own right, but also recognize that there are a lot of things that may be going well. And so I think that that's an important thing to realize internally as well. Um, the fourth thing that we've done at UC San Diego in particular, and, and I, I, I think that there are other uh, institutions that benefit is ask for and seek out a healer education assessment referral program. Our, our own institution at UC San Diego, it was a voluntary program, but I would say 95% plus, I, I actually don't even know a single person who did not actually sign up to do it. And we all found it very useful. And this complements one-on-one -on -one counseling and as required psychotherapy and psychiatry involvement. I think it's really, really important to have a place where uh, you can process and work through some issues um, that, that maybe your, your significant other or your family or friends can't help you uh, with. Um, and then finally, you know, I, I like to have different types of stimuli, whether they're books, podcasts, Music is something that I, I particularly enjoy. These are some podcasts that I've come across. I've actually learned about Sam Harris recently. He's a really interesting um, philosopher, neuroscientist on some of these issues. But whatever those things are, really take yourself out of the medical context and, and see if you can um, find yourself in engagement outside of that. Okay, then the next point is after the moment is to process it externally. So what do I mean by that? Well, there's a way to take what you're feeling and, and sublimate it or, or move it into a context where you can provide a, an outlet. So whether it's journaling or painting, or for me, it's playing music, I play violin, some, play, some way of expressing your feelings outwardly. Um, you may wanna talk to significant others, friends, parents, those who, especially as I mentioned before, who might've helped you through difficult times in the past. And we all remember an internship that was pretty, pretty intense how do we get through that? We relied on each other. We, we leaned on each other uh, and that's how we get through. And sometimes those relationships, those bonds can, can play a part here too. So our own team at UC San Diego, uh, we've created teams and supervisors who can um, basically collect our thoughts and create a forum where we can talk through these issues and find solutions. And that goes on an ongoing basis. And we've actually identified several different um, opportunities there too, and, and proactively I um, intervened in places where people are getting into the red zone. You may wanna find opportunities in the, in the community to talk. I've actually reached out to the Kiwanis group, the Rotary groups. Um, not only is that a way for you to give back and feel good about um, um, contributing to a larger conversation, but I think these groups also value your expertise and your input and your feelings about that. And, and give them another way to get um, information apart from what they hear on the news or from just their own personal experience. Um, you may want to take this into a private enterprise. So I'm actually trying to, as we speak, try to um, put in some um, effort into making some YouTube videos on some basic education on the ICU. Some people may take this into a startup venture. Uh, you maybe want to be a consultant for some of these wellness startups or, or other types of companies, because everybody's really focusing on this, this area. 
And then the last thing is really think about contributing formally. Um, there are platforms like the one I'm on right now, but there are, there are avenues to write, to speak, um, where you can contribute to a national conversation, an international conversation about this very important idea. The conversation is a, a place where you can um, contribute academic, it, it's actually designed for academics um, to, to create and, and promote um, some writing. Uh, a lot of the op-eds are taking um, submissions from you know, physicians who, because it is so current and so important. And I just mentioned one um, piece that I wrote a couple months ago in Annals of Internal Medicine. So even our medical journals are really focusing a lot of attention on this very important issue. Finally, take a, take a step to think about the next moment. So have a plan. It doesn't have to, to creep up on you without your knowledge. Um, and it doesn't have to be perfect. Remember that this is a journey, just like everything. It's a stepwise approach. Think about it constructively, like a constructivist would in a learning health system that you don't have to solve this overnight. Uh, be open to doing things maybe a little bit differently. You may have to try some things out. Um, and remember not to disparage your efforts or those around you or suppress those thoughts and feelings. You are not only going to give yourself a way to process it, but you'll also find there are a lot of others who are feeling the same things as you, and we hope that with, with forums like this uh, and opportunities to collect our thoughts as a group, that the power of our collective can be heard and make a difference. And this is, I just mentioned another article that came out um, a month ago about this very topic. So this is very current, it's very important, and it's getting attention. So in some way, I just want to say that, you know, you're not alone. There are a lot of us across the world that are feeling this. Um, try to develop some self-awareness about how your body responds to some of these triggers and how to take steps to be proactive in the moment. After that, that moment has passed, try to process that internally and externally and prepare for the next moment as part of a stepwise move to make you more, more stable in the moment and, and as, they, as they succeed and really try to make your voice heard because we all need your voice uh, and our, the biggest um, hope for change is, is collectively together with all of you. So let me let me leave it there, and I'm happy to answer questions after uh, Dr. Ely speaks. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramnath. You you definitely left us with a lot of great practical tips that I I'm hoping a lot of people in the audience will take away, and I know I'll definitely take away. Um, so I'd like to introduce our next speaker now, uh, Dr. Wes Ely. Uh, Dr. Ely is a professor of medicine at Vanderbilt University. Uh, Dr. Ely's research has focused on improving the care and outcomes of critically ill patients with ICU-acquired brain disease. He is the co-director of the Center for Critical Illness, Brain Dysfunction, and Survivorship, which has amassed thousands of patients over the years into cohort studies. Um, his team developed the primary tool, CAM ICU, which has now been translated into 30 plus languages and is used to measure delirium in ICU-based trials. With the COVID-19 pandemic, though, Dr. Ely has moved into a space of not only COVID-19-related delirium, dementia, respiratory failure, clinical therapeutic trials, but he's been a staunch advocate for vaccinations and public health policy. Uh, in addition, he very recently published his new book, Every Deep Drawn Breath, uh, which has been described as a must read for ICU physicians and very important work on ICU survivorship and humanism in medicine. So Dr. Ely, thank you for being here with us today. We're looking forward to speaking with you. Oh, you're on mute, sir. Thank you so much. And can you hear me okay now? Fantastic. Yeah, I'm using, uh, I'm, I'm about to share with you some data on uh, po uh, Twitter poll questions that mirrored those of Ankita and I was using my book to prop up the phone so this is this is the, the way my book looks every deep drawn breath and these are my notes on the side but more importantly it's propping up my phone and I've got these data to share with you that's hilarious yeah so I want to start by just telling you a couple of stories that I think are relevant to this and I'll try and be brief so we can get to the questions I had a woman recently that had COVID she was on um high flow nasal cannula and she was from rural Tennessee. I was taking care of her. I had her on baricitinib and dexamethasone 
and remdesivir. She was getting worse. She was very scared. And she asked me, can you get a message to my family to get vaccinated? And of course, I said, yes, no question. I'll do that. But as I got to know her more, uh, it came up. Why did she choose not to get vaccinated? And I knelt by her bed and was holding her hand and talking with her. And she started crying. And she said, the man on TV said that they were trying to depopulate society of people like me. And you could tell that she actually sincerely believed that that was what was happening. And some state congressman somewhere apparently had gotten on TV and said that. I don't know the person's name, but some of you may know who that was. And anyway, she was misled. She was given misinformation and she was, uh, in my mind, not to be held accountable and or to be judged for believing that she was the victim of some sort of a uh, of a depopulation pro program, especially because a couple of years earlier here in her own county in Tennessee, a judge had made a decision to offer people sterilization if they would get out of jail earlier, which prompted me to write a very quick op-ed and say, what the hell? You know, we, we are not going backwards in time towards eugenics. So there's a lot that people carry in with them into our care. And when we are called to the bedside, I think that the approach that I take is to try to get to know this person, understand who they are, what they're bringing in. And I think that right now in the pandemic, the temptation is to allow these people to be put through a depersonalization chamber so that they come in in technicolor with loves, likes, dislikes, prejudices and all that. And we put them through this depersonalization chamber and they end up with all gray zone on the other side. And that's just not the way that I want to practice medicine. So I'm not saying that anybody on this call has done that, but I'm telling you that I have been tempted to do that. So I'm not pointing fingers at anybody other than me. And my, the way that I approached this woman was just to get to know her, find out what her fears were, and to try and understand what, what brought her to that bad decision to not get vaccinated, which is my, my opinion. Um, I used that episode to actually create a vaccination program in the ICU. This was back in June, I think, or July at Vanderbilt. And we started vaccinating people up in the unit after getting their consent. That, that was brought up by Ankita earlier. But So we get these people's back, we get, get their consents, we get their family members' consents, and we use that as a teachable moment to get a bunch of people vaccinated right there on the front lines and um, I, I just think that the lesson for me was that I'm too quick to judge. And the second thing that happened to me was down the, down the hall, I'm, I'm, in, I'm envisioning all these rooms, all of us can picture who was where and what room they were in. And there was this wonderful gentleman came in, he was on BiPAP, and I was getting to know him for the first time because I just came on service. He was on full bore medical therapy and getting worse. And he, I said, what do you do for a living, sir? And he said, I teach truck drivers. And I thought, okay, he's teaching truck drivers. He's with truck drivers. He's not vaccinated. And I said, and what made you decide not to get vaccinated? He said, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm vaccinated. He goes, I just let my guard down. So he got double vaccinated with Pfizer and he meant that he didn't wear a mask around people and he got a breakthrough uh, COVID infection. So those are two people that were bookends for me that really stood out as, as important lessons for me to try and avoid judgment, to take people's fears accordingly. And when I get to know them, what I find out is it's a burnout prevention program for me. When I stay at the surface and I stay essentially at an arm's length, uh, I'm thinking of equanimitas, you know, Osler's famous uh, essay, equanimitas, which is, you know, keep your equanimity, stay at a link, don't get too involved, don't get to know them too much, you're going to get, you know, hurt if they die sort of thing. That didn't work for me. Um, for many years as an intensivist, I was getting burned out. And this is, I discuss this a lot in every deep drawn breath. I kind of had to go through a period of, of working through my own shame and heartache and guilt at not diving all the way into my patient's lives and COVID has really kind of amped up my own personal need to 
find out who these people are, kneel at their bedside, hold their hand, listen with them when they're scared and figure it out. And for me anyway, that has stopped me from getting frustrated. It stopped me from, from, from doing as much judging as I normally do, which is terrible. And those are my initial thoughts about this. Uh, I want to tell one last story. And it was a woman who came, a woman who came in with COVID and the husband had COVID and wanted to come visit her. And the question came up, should, should he be allowed to do that? And so I put a Twitter poll out and I said, your COVID patient is dying because she was dying and the husband wants to visit, but he also has COVID and is shedding virus. He had just been diagnosed two days earlier. So I knew he was shedding thousands of virions. And, uh, and, the, and I, I gave him two options. One is he's vaccinated. And the second option was this guy's not vaccinated. And if the patient was vaccinated, if the husband was vaccinated, half of the people thought that he should be able to visit the dying wife. That number dropped it precipitously if he was unvaccinated. So the, the take home for me was that people are factoring in vaccination as a um, as do these people deserve the privilege of us accepting risk for them to come in the hospital. And the second one, Twitter poll that I did was I'm looking at these infographics that I created for them was basically we were running out of ECMO circuits and we had one ECMO circuit left and we had a crap load of people in the ED and they were coming up to the unit and we were like, what are we going to do? And we all started talking, myself, Todd Rice, Matt Simler. We were just in the back room trying to get our notes done, but we got all sidetracked about should vaccination matter? And I will tell you that when I, this was, this was answered by 23,000 people on Twitter. And this is not statistical and it's not valid or anything like that, but vaccination was majorly factored into these decisions such that people thought, you know, I don't care if you're a doctor or a nurse, if you're unvaccinated, I'm not, I'm not giving you that, that precious resource. And if it was even a, if, if you were a dog walker, but you were vaccinated, people were much more inclined to give that precious resource. So my take on it is I want to give the precious resource. I'll tell you my answer to that is whoever can benefit the most. That's my answer is I, I am not going to factor in the vaccination into that, into, that, uh, into that decision at the bedside about who should get ECMO, who shouldn't. I'm going to try and make my decision based on who will benefit the most. But I think I'm in the minority here because everything I found on Twitter and, and, and most conversations with my colleagues is that people, the fever pitch has been reached and people are factoring in vaccinations. So I'm gonna stop there, see what kind of questions there are. And, um, and I'm totally open to criticism here. I'm not saying I'm right. And I told you that I find myself to be too judgmental in these circumstances. So those are my thoughts. Uh, yeah, you. no, thank you so much, Dr. Ely. I think your thoughts are right on point. And every single one of us on this call has had very similar patient experiences to what you have described. So we really appreciate your thoughts on humanity and, and really getting to know the patient. I think there's been um, some sort of thoughts really in the chat, um, you know, people talking about how, uh, how we really shouldn't judge because, uh, and as you clearly pointed out, a lot of our patients in the ICU are, are victims, you know, they're victims of misinformation, they're victims of following somebody who is giving them a story that they have believed, you know, and, and unfortunately it landed them in the ICU. So um, I wholeheartedly believe that. And I think um, it makes it very difficult. And some of the other thoughts we have in the chat is that, you know, we, especially in the South, as you're also experiencing uh, very high volume patients right now. And I think that makes it very difficult for our trainees, for us, for our nurses, for our respiratory therapists to spend the quality of time we'd all like to spend in these rooms. And I think that also propagates this sort of, you know, isolation from the patient and not getting to know them like we should. Um, along those lines, I, I kind of wonder your thoughts, you and uh, Dr. Ramna, you know, in this fourth, fifth sort of surge that we're all experiencing, I think many of us have um, felt lots of anger from patients and families as well, you know, as they've come to the ICU, um, that anger has led to uh, demands 
and requests for treatment, for different things that they have heard, you know, from their local politician or Facebook or wherever else they've heard it from. And um, I know many of our nurses in the ICU are fielding, they're such saints, fielding these phone calls, you know, sometimes every hour from patient family members. And I wonder um, that if the two of you have any thoughts on that or, or suggestions or how you might have handled it um, as you're dealing with that in this fourth surge. Hey, Tess, you want to go ahead? Uh, sure. So, I mean, I, I do think that <clears throat> one of the things that we're not, we're not as good as I would say our um, nurse colleagues uh, is organizing our thoughts. I mean, th this form right here is a great way of bringing up the issues we're all feeling about. Like you said, there's a huge isolationist component of this. When I, when I wrote my that moral injury piece and uh, annals, so many people just read, nurses included, saying, I'm so glad you gave a voice to something that we're all feeling in this third, fourth, fifth wave, uh, well, hopefully not a fifth wave, fourth wave now, um, that we're all fearing it's gonna come back. Um, so I do think that one of the take homes here is we have to, we have to collect our thoughts and, and put these issues at the forefront so that we can actually deal with them seriously. So that's the first point. Second thing is, um, and I think someone mentioned this in the chat too, is um, you know, how do we find the time? I mean, there's already a moral injury with that too, right? We just don't have the time or the dilemma, I should say, or even the sequelae. We don't have the time maybe to spend the kind of, and we all want to, like Dr. Ely was saying, we, even if we were able to be self-aware enough to say, Let, yes, I need to take that extra step, the system doesn't really allow us to do that. And so the question I am asking myself is how can I contribute to a system improvement that will allow me and my team to engage with folks in a different way? And so that's where I think some of the things I was trying to mention um, are, are ways to self-soothe, to self-care, but also contribute to a structural change that will allow us to actually move forward as a system. And so I, I don't know if that specifically answers your question, but I, I do think um, there are ways out of this, but I do think it starts with us to really get clear. And you know, even actually as a critical care medicine this month is saying, you know, we need to get a more collected approach um, and, and look at you know, burnout, moral injury, as well as palliative care. I mean, all of these things are sort of different pieces of the pie. How do we do this in a way that um, is, is organized and, and methodical and delivers? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I'd like to make a quick comment. Uh, first off, Big Dash, your piece in Annals was wonderful. I loved it. And I used it actually to help me write my last Wash WAPO, Washington Post op-ed at the bottom part, I, I talked about moral injury and I used your piece to help me uh, understand it better. So thank you. I, what are, a couple of the practical things that I do on rounds are that, uh, first off, I really believe that the F in the A2F bundle, the A, B, C, D, E, F bundle, which I just call A2F, the F is family. And we're all really busy. Having family on rounds saves so much time. And I want to just counter the myth that having family usurps time. It's the opposite. Because if you have the family on rounds, you set up the ground rules that we're going to have one or two people. That's it. Not, not a whole group of people. But one to two people can be on rounds with us. And at the end of rounds, I'll offer you a 30 second to one minute lay summary. And you can ask me one minute's worth of questions. That, these are just our ground rules. So we're not getting into a five minute long conversation. And we're not on family rounds. We are not. And, and when I say family rounds, I just mean rounds. Like this is actually just regular rounds. We are not changing our lingo. I tell the family, you're going to hear us talk medical. You may not understand a thing of it, but at the end, I'm going to give you a lay talk. When we try and dummy down our conversation to do non-medical, that ruins the whole conversation. So the medical conversation has to stay the same, then lay to them, and then they question back to us. That will save you hours a day in, in family conferences. I mean, I, it's unbelievable how much time I save. But in addition, the thing that happens is this. The second tool is switching the preposition. And, um, and so instead of saying, what's the matter with someone, say what, mat what matters to someone. So Miss Smith, instead of saying, Miss Smith, here's what's the matter with you. Miss Smith, what matters to you? And so if she's in the room and around, but the family's out there, we can say, 
Mr. Smith, what matters to Ms. Smith? And then the point is that when you switch that preposition, you quickly figure out things like goals of care much earlier. And Keita's patient, we did goals of care at like day 20 or something. And, but I know they were having conversations earlier, but I'm just saying, you know, you got to your end of life at the end. But when you have family on rounds routinely, you get all that stuff really much earlier and it paves the way. So what I do is I assign, I know that if I've got 20 people in service, I can't have 20 conversations with every one of those people. But I say, okay, who's taking Mr. Smith? Who's taking Mr. Jones? Who's taking Betty? And we, we each to divvy it up so that everybody goes into that room, kneels down, holds their hand and says, what matters to you? What are your fears? And so every patient is going to get that conversation. It just may not be all done by me. That's a practical thing that I try and do on rounds every time, every day. Yeah, that's a, that's a great tip, Wes. Um, are you having family members there in your COVID unit too, like on rounds and full PPE with your patients? We have family, uh, we have, so right now the, the families are, Vanderbilt was one of the first hospitals to reopen to visitation to non-COVID. Then I think we were one the first ones to allow COVID people up in the room, but they, but they don't come in when they're still shedding virus into the room. They go into the room when they're testing negative, but they're all, but they're on, they're in the hallways. Yes. They're in the families are in the yeah. hallways, they're outside the room. We have them with us there on rounds. And of course, anybody who's. Oh, you just froze. Hmm. Okay. I'll just, we'll just give Dr. Ely a minute. Comfort, you know, whispering in oh. the ear. Yeah. Wes, you froze for there for a minute, so we didn't catch the end of that. <laughs> Sorry. Hold on. No worries. We're, we're good now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. I, we're I, good I, now. I'll just give you that one last statement. I actually think there's no way to quantify this, but I think that people are in the ground dead who might have made it if loved ones could have been with them. I mean, when people lose hope. Yeah. Yeah. There's no way to measure it, but. I agree. We were, um, I was a very staunch advocate for having families um, very early in the COVID pandemic. And I think, you know, from a hospital administration perspective, that's always difficult because they're, you know, want to limit people, but it's just so important. Um, okay, I, I will say about the anger. Yeah. It's not only politicians doing this. All of us on the, I'm not going to say names, but we all know a group of doctors who are pushing ivermectin or you know, anti vac I mean, it's insane. And the, yeah. how does the public know if you've got MD behind your name, MD is MD is MD. So it's it, people within our profession are causing this problem. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I feel, you know, and I'm just going to say this from my perspective, this is one of the first times I feel like as an ICU doctor that I've had conversations with family who have shown up with lists of treatment for the disease. Like never in my you know, somewhat limited ICU career, have I ever had a doctor show up with, this is what I'm requesting for sepsis. This is what I'm requesting for ARDS. But they are coming with, this is what I want for my loved one to get during COVID. And I think that's also been a struggle, uh, at least for our staff, for sure, and for my team that I've noticed. Yeah, one thing that I'll just share along those lines is um, at the same time that we should be maybe uh, trying to, to trying to understand and, and empathically connect as we always should be with shared decision making with families. We we also don't we should not be shying away from tough conversations around the lists that Dr. Cribbs is getting or the fact that someone did not get vaccinated and have a really frank, candid, respectful. But, but honest dialogue about this because a lot of people don't want to talk about it. They don't, they don't want you to talk about it. And unfortunately, you know, I, I'm not going to go into, you know, the, 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 the um, commentaries about how, you know, classical liberalism is, is fading. But the idea is that we've lost some forms that create structure for folks to know which information to trust. Who are the, who are the people that own the information 
uh, um, that you can you can rely on. And it used to be doctors. And as Dr. Ely is saying, I mean, we we've done some disservice to our own craft here because some folks are getting you know the attention that we, we don't want. Um, but we shouldn't be quiet about that. You know, we 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 need to collect and be able to create a message that is open and honest, but also fair um, around some of these issues. So when when you when we see those lists, and I get those lists too, <laughs> um, you know, how do we talk through that and say, look, we can find a way through, but we have to understand that I am a professional, and this is why I'm a professional, and I understand your position, but you're not an equal. Uh, arbiter of the facts, right? Uh, in, in the sense of what treatments are gonna be the most appropriate at this time. Um, and there's a way to do that empathically, there's a way to do that with families, but it sh we should not be um, you know, reticent about that. We shouldn't be reluctant to get into those kinds of sticky things. It doesn't have to be political. It doesn't have to be religious. It just has to be honest and, and focused on the medicine. Yeah, you just brought up uh, one thing about the vaccine that I think everybody I've been using as an educational thing is that in in the area of religion, when people are choosing not to get vaccinated, can y'all hear me? Mm -hmm. People are choosing not to get vaccinated because they're worried about like um, stem cells and stuff like that. I just want everybody to know that that's true of every drug in your in your medicine cabinet. And uh, there is nothing at all that is specific to the vaccine. And the, the, the major vaccines we're using weren't created uh, with those stem cells anyway. They were only tested. And there's really no organized religion that I'm aware of uh, on a world scale has come out uh, opposing the vaccine. And um, I, that, that argument just does not hold water. I've tweeted this out several times. And so I, I, I've had several patients where I've said, you know, all of your medicines, including ivermectin, have been tested with that same situation, the same, it's HEC 453, I think is the cell line. And they're like, ivermectin? I'm like, yeah, so no <laughs> ivermectin for you. Uh, like the soup Nazi, no soup for you. Right. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I think a lot, of, I've had some people say, okay, okay, give me the vaccine then. So we have to teach. Yeah, I agree. It's really been a, a, a wall of misinformation that from so many directions that I think we've all had to struggle with. Um, I'm just looking at one of the other chats. Laura, you shared a story in the chat. Do you wanna unmute and share it? Sure, it was had definitely just one of the more frustrating moments. And it was actually like back-to-back -back patients in their 30s and 40s who were, you know, about to get intubated and they were like looking up stuff on their iPhones and being like, couldn't you give me this? Couldn't you give me that? And I'm like, you know what? Evidence-based medicine, I could have practiced for you like weeks and months ago, the vaccine. Like it was just so frustrating. Yeah, and uh, Laura, to your point, um, other people are putting in the chat that, you know, hearing, you know, profanities and other things getting yelled at, everyone's just mentally exhausted. So I think it's even more important. Um, and Mengtesh, you alluded to this is, you know, our compassion bucket being empty, you know, our empathy bucket being empty and thinking about ways that we can refill that uh, as best as we can, I think is, is so critical for our continued humanity in this process. Right, and, it, and it's not a personal individual journey. I mean, the, the, we should be, um, and, and I think it's changing. I, I think it's, it's a little too slow for my, for my <laughs> liking, but I think people are noticing and institutions are starting to really pay attention because you can't have, I mean, we look at our nurse staffing. I mean, it's all crippled because um, nurses feel like it's just too much, you know, and, and, and rightfully so. And so doctors, you know, we're people too, and you can't, like the person said in the chat, you can't really walk by, you know, antipathy through a, a crowd of that and not feel something if you're going to be trying to connect with families on the other end. So we have to be mindful of ourselves, but also understand that we can, um, you know, sort of collect and tell that message to the folks that can take things on a different level as well. 
Well, it looks like we're at nine o'clock, but I, I would like to get um, just some last thoughts. Uh, uh, Wes, you were about to say something that you'd like to leave the group with maybe to kind of help them. I think it was even therapeutic just putting our feelings in the chat here and talking about our stories. So, Well, I'll leave you with two thoughts. One is that when I am cussed at or uh, aggressed macro or micro aggressed towards from a patient, I just try to remember that it's about them, not about me. And this is something that they're bringing to the table. It's just like we have with any of our relationships in our life is that we need to not take that personally. I know that's easier said than done. And I'm not trying to pretend that that's easy to do, but I just try and remember that I'm there to serve them. And, and that doesn't, I, I don't only serve them when they're being polite to me. Uh, I want to serve the difficult patient just as much as I want to serve the easy patient. That's my job as a physician. And then, and then the last, the second thing I want to leave you with is that I've never considered it more of a privilege to be a physician than right now in the pandemic. And that may sound crazy because it is rough and it's, it's hard, hard on me. The hardest thing on me is when I see the nurses who have these cavernous eyes. And they were, I remember when they came in bright eyed and bushy tailed and excited and they're burnt to a crisp and it's yeah. just, it's just disheartening. And that's all the more reason I want to be up there with them and with the patients. So I'm doubling down on the fact that this is my privilege to be there. And um, that's what I'm going with. Thanks for letting me be here tonight. Yeah, it's incredibly inspiring. Thank you. Do you have any last uh, last words for the group? All I would say is something that echoes before maybe two points. One is that you're not alone. Everybody on this call and beyond this call is feeling the same challenges. They're not going to go away tonight or tomorrow, but we're going to make progress together. That's what we need. To, we rely on each other. We got through internship. We got through fellowship. We got through everything. We're going to get through this. This is what this is all about. And then the second thing is, Remember what, what Dr. Ely said is to be able to not take things personally when things are hurled at you starts with yourself, right? You have to be able to have the self-awareness and that's what the meditation and, the, and, and yoga and all the other things that we know are holistic and, and well-being oriented. Um, please try to take care about that and develop some skills that work for you in order to build up that shield uh, when you walk in it because you have to give back to your family too. They rely on you in different ways. Um, you know, outside the workplace. It's not just about work. So uh, let me leave it there. I, I typed something in the chat and, and the spell check corrected. It's, it's kind of persona. <laughs> persona S and, uh, early on, Lancet had a COVID test and I, I put a story in there that's in every deep drawn breath. And, and it's about two patients. I know we got to go. I'll be very brief. Two, oh, patients, you're fine. two patients who got COVID and they were separated by hundreds of miles of hospitals they were, had been married for 60 years. And the doctor told the family, it doesn't matter. They're going to get treated. You hear me? Yeah, it just cut out for a second, but we're okay. It doesn't matter. You're going to get treat, the same treatment. And they're, they're both going to die. And the family was like, if they're going to, then that's the only thing that matters is getting them back together. Cata persona es and mundo. Every person is a world. And just never, we can never lose sight of the depth and the breadth of and the dignity of each of these people we're caring for, whether they're vaccinated or not. I mean, that's what they're bringing in. And that that's what keeps me coming. I saw somebody wrote, this is history and I'm showing up. Bam. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Allison, thank you for putting that in. I think you said it perfectly. So on that note, I just want to thank everyone for taking time out of their evening to join us today. Um, thank you, especially to our speakers for spending this hour with us. We really appreciate having you. I think this is not a one and done deal, something that we're all gonna continue to struggle with. And um, I think having a collective, like you said, Bengtesh, is just so important that we can all just commiserate for a little bit and know that we're not alone in this. So thank you all. We really appreciate having you. All right, thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.